Financial aid award letters do contain all of these components, usually. I mean, if you're lucky to get a merit scholarship or institutional grant, uh, great. But they're always going to have the loans. Pretty, you know, just 99.5% are going to have the loans. Um, some, there, I, I saw one from Villanova this year. It was called, uh, I wrote it down, alternative funding opportunities. That's another word for a loan. And it's kind of misleading to say that, you, but it just means you can borrow more money. And uh, that, that's just an odd way of putting it. I put it out to the, my professional group and they just, wow, what won't they come up with next? Um, so first time freshman, you get to borrow, as you know, if you're a parent of a, a high school senior going to college this fall, you've already got the information on the subsidized loans, unsubsidized, 5,500. No more than $3,500 can be subsidized. I'll to talk about what that means. Um, and depending on your financial need at that particular school, uh, you may get 3,500 or less in a subsidized loan and more than 2,000 in, uh, in what's called an unsubsidized loan. So it just depends. Um, there is an exception. Uh, students can borrow more than the first year 5,500 limit if the parents uh, you know, have bad credit or they're turned down for some reason, they can get an extra $4,000. That's, uh, that's important to know. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I had that twice. All right. Uh, these are the second, third, and fourth year loans. Uh, you could borrow a total of 6,500 for the second year. And then uh, for the junior and senior years, no more than 7,500. No, and they do increase uh, the subsidized portion by $1,000 in the sophomore year and $2,000 in junior and senior years. So that's where you end up with a total of combined debt. If you qualify for the, you know, if you have enough need, it totals up to $27,000 between the unsubsidized of 8,000, 19,000 subsidized, total of 27,000, figure at 5%, your students looking at $338 per month for 10 years. That's $338, 120 payments. Okay, slide over here. Okay, one great advantage uh, of the subsidized loan is that even though uh, you can afford, if, let's say you, you can afford to pay for college, so you don't need it, it's a good idea to take it because it's free. It's basically free money. There is a 1% origination fee, but that's little enough. And you get to use the money for free. The government's going to be paying the interest rate while your student's in school and for all four years and for six months after. So that's a, it's a pretty good deal. Um, the loan is in the student's name. There's going to be a credit check, but it, it, they don't look at actual credit. They just ask for references. Usually it's mom or dad, aunt or uncle or grandparent, and that's it. Um, this year's interest rate, it's still a low rate. Last year was 2.75%. This year, it's up a point to 3.734%. This has just came out uh, in mid-May. Um, it's still a good rate. It's, it's not expensive at all. Um, now, unsubsidized loans. We've got the subsidized, and now we've got the unsubsidized. Sometimes they call them Stafford loans. Just depends on the school and how they, usually they're going to say direct loans. That's a, a federal loan, so you know it's federal. So the unsubsidized loan, you don't have to qualify for financial need. This is a loan you can get up to $5,500 for a student with no financial need. Again, it's in the student's name. It's guaranteed by the government. You just need one parent, one reference required, and it's got the same fixed interest rate. The one thing about it, though, I do want to make a, a mention. Um, the government, since they're not paying the interest on it, um, it doesn't qualify for special programs like deferment. Let's say the, stu the student uh, graduates a year or two out, doesn't have a job. The subsidized loan, they can go into deferment and no interest will be charged and it won't accrue. That's the difference between uh, one of the good, bad things of, of these loans. But uh, the subsidized loan, I mean, the unsubsidized does have some pretty good advantages. We're going to go over those as well. Okay. You got some popular repayment programs here. The standard, depending on the amount you borrow, you can pay, repay over 10 to 30 years. Obviously, the longer, the more interest you're going to pay. The graduated repayment, you start out with a little, and every two years, they increase it a bit, goes out to 30 years. And they have this extended one that the maximum is 25 years, and you pay uh, 
a, a specific amount over that period. Don't know too many people that actually take that um, take that uh, uh, option. Um, now here are some uh, other repayment options that uh, do not include the plus loans. There's an asterisk there for a reason. I'll explain that. Um, even though uh, you're not in the repayment stage yet and won't be for you know some time, you should be aware that there are currently a total of eight ways. I just listed three uh, to repay student loans. Um, but as I mentioned before, there is a parent loan repayment strategy as well that's not included in this. And if you can or you want, you can prepay the loans at any time and there's no penalty for doing so. Uh, and you can see as the, from the previous slide that, that the range is between 10 and 30 years to repay depending on the type of repayment pro program. Um, now, these five, income-based repayment, IBR, income contingent, ICR, income sensitive, pay as you earn, uh, revised pay as you earn, these are all programs that will allow you to pay different amounts and do involve some loan forgiveness. Not for the parents, unless you adopt some strategies, which we're gonna, of course, talk about. Um, let's see, just wanna stay on track here. So what are the, some of the good things about the direct subsidized loans? Well, as I already mentioned, the government's gonna be taking care of the interest. And if for some reason, as I said, the student falls on hard times, they're gonna be able to get uh, their servicer to forgive that interest and it won't accrue or be capitalized as long as that situation exists. Um, so that's a good thing. See, that's the problem if you, with unsubsidized loans and you don't pay the interest, uh, that gets capitalized at the end. In other words, you're paying, they're taking the interest you didn't pay, adding it to the principal balance at the, at the end of the year, and now you're paying, I'll, I'll give you an example of that so you, you, you can see that. Okay. Then there is um, uh, forbearance. Um, now, during a forbearance, you can either pay the interest as it accrues, or you can allow it to accrue and be capitalized, which isn't the greatest thing in the world. But if that's your option, if that's what you need to do, you can do that. And that's a good thing. Um, so you have options and it doesn't hurt your credit to do that. Um, and you can request a general for, uh, forbearance um, if for any number of reasons, like financial difficulties, medical expenses, change in, in, in employment, um, and any other reasons that are acceptable to your loan servicer. Then there's the option, and this is where things get good, uh, especially for parents. You have the option of consolidating all of these loans you might be taking over the years for all of your children into one loan. And it, 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 a couple of advantages. One, it makes it easier to pay one loan than eight or 10 because you're gonna take one out for each year. If you're borrowing on a plus loan for four years, that's four loans. If you have two children and you're doing the same thing, that's eight loans. And if you have some of your own, you haven't paid those off, well, then you have those loans. So they could consolidating them into one can, can make a lot of sense. Um, there's no fees for doing it, uh, but you can only consolidate, uh, in most cases, one time per loan. But there's an exception, and we're going to get to that. Um, you're just going to want to know all your options. Right? Then there's this program, Public Service Loan Forgiveness. Uh, Honestly, it started out to be a great idea, and then it turned into a terrible thing. Um, as it matured a few years ago, all of a sudden people were trying to you know, get their loans discharged and they found out their servicers had lied to them and misled them and didn't keep up with their paperwork. And they found that they didn't get their loans discharged after the public service jobs they took. And they only took them because they wanted to do good. And now they're working on things, Biden administration's working on it, Trump did a little something with it. Uh, hopefully it's going to continue to imp improve. There is a servicer who's really more on top of it, Fed loans, uh, they're on top of it versus the other dozen or so. Uh, so that is a possibility even for parents. Now, if you have parent loans, it, it just depends who you work for. Um, another great thing is, uh, is not having to deal with a loan if the student, God forbid, or you, the borrower, die or become uh, totally disabled. That's just, that's just gone. And there's no taxes due at the end of that, no tax bomb. Okay. Now, unsubsidized loans also have some good features as well. Doesn't have, to ha doesn't have the hardship deferral 
uh, the subsidized loan does. But if there's a problem repaying the loan, there you do have the option of forbearance. And you can request that up to three times for each loan for up to a year at a time. So if times get tough, you can you know put off those loans and uh, not have your credit affected at all, which is nice. Can't do that necessarily with a private loan. I'll talk about those in a few minutes. The bad part about the unsubsidized loan is the government doesn't pay the interest while you're in school. So it's not ugly, but it is, it's not great. Um, kind of the ugly part is that the interest accrues and capitalizes. As I said, it gets tacked on at the end of the year. So you're paying interest on interest. Not a great thing. Um, we're going to talk about how you can prevent that from happening. So all these loans, student loans, have an origination fee. As you can see, it's 1.062%. Um, so when you take out the full 5,500, that's going to be taken off the loan, paid back to the treasury, and then the school's going to get $5,440. Usually uh, on the financial aid award letters recently, uh, I shouldn't say usually, but lately they've been adding those student loan fees and, and uh, tacking them onto your package. Okay. Uh, so where are we? Ah. Okay, here's the ugly part of all student loans. Um, they can be expensive. You know, they can really make starting out pretty tough when you have a lot of debt. Um, the more you borrow, the less you have for other things. And a lot of students do get into trouble. We have a $1.7 trillion student loan debt owed to this country. Um, some of that's parent debt, but the majority of it is student debt. Loans mean starting out uh, life with, you know, basically, uh, I'd liken it to, I was, I was driving to, to California a couple of weeks ago and I was driving through mountain roads. I live in Idaho and I was making my way through Oregon and, and Nevada. And some of the roads are very windy, single lane, uh, you know, no places to pass. Um, and I'm behind giant trucks. And I just felt like it just slowed me down. And, and you know, it just made it hard to, to get to stay on track. I wanted to make the drive in eight hours, just made it hard. Same with these student loans, it just makes it hard uh, to get ahead. But if you have the right strategies in place, you can manage that. It's just do it right the, from the outset. Don't wait until you get into trouble because sometimes you, the moves you make, especially with consolidation, you can't redo those. Once it's done, it's over. Um, paying off loans means you know, putting off other life goals. Very possible that you could delay your your life, like, uh, you know, buying a car, a house, uh, getting married, having kids, um, you know, starting a business. It just can make it very difficult. Uh, and, and it's almost impossible to get rid of these things in bankruptcy. Um, the laws changed a number of years ago and they just made student debt. You know, you can discharge most things in bankruptcy except student loans. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, any bankruptcy attorney, attorney will tell you, forget it. Um, you have to basically show that you're totally, and now and in the future, going to be incapable of being paying any of the debt, uh, and that your life is not going to get any better uh, with them. So it's tough. And defaulting, uh, of course, just ruins your credit. And, uh, you know, not a good thing. Now, there are private loans. And I want to mention these. Um, there are some good things. You'll notice there's three things here. This is it. You have higher borrowing limits. So if a student can only get 5,500 for their student loan, well, student could borrow, say, $50,000. Um, the lower rates uh, do exist for, for if you have really good credit. And uh, if you get into trouble, there's a statute of limitations that you know they can't go after you after, depending on your state. They usually range from three to six years. So you can you know be in a situation where uh, uh, you know they can't touch you, um, but they're going to try before they get to that those statutes of limitations. Now, here's the bad. The federal loans have these income-driven repayment programs, which is good and even public service forgiveness. Uh, the, the, the bad part is that private loans don't have any of that. Uh, their interest rates could go as high as 25%. There's no federal subsidies. You don't get student loan protections like the Fed gives you. And I don't know many students 
uh, who are 18 years old going to college who, you know, want, who, who would qualify to borrow $25,000, for example. So they need a co-signer. And that's a great risk to the co-signer, right? So what you're looking at are loans that are less flexible, make it more difficult to have any kind of forbearance options to change your payment programs either. And they don't offer plans. Let's say you're, you're making a lot of money one year and then you know the Fed would say, okay, you're gonna pay more of this year. And then you make less. Well, the government would say, okay, then you pay less. But the banks, they don't care. They're gonna want their money. And if your credit starts to fall, they'll just jack up your interest rates. And there is the risk of overborrowing. Um, with parent loans, especially when you go directly uh, to the government, they go to the school and the school tells you how much you can borrow. And generally that's the cost of attendance, less any financial aid the students received, and then they'll certify up to that amount. So the, you can't really overborrow, at least because you can get into trouble that way. You don't want to do that. Um, so if you stop paying back these loans, a lender can bring you to court, they can demand repayment, but they only have a certain amount of time to do so, like I mentioned, three to six years. Um, but once your stones, once your loan statute limitations uh, are up, they can still sue you in other, and they can still chase you for that money. They're not gonna let you go. They're not gonna let you walk away. Um, it's important to understand the harmful consequences. They can take your disability payments. They can garnish your pay. If you die, they can go after your estate. Um, even if your parents should pass away and the, the, the loan will go into default, even if you are making the payments. And that's a big mess to get out. So I like to, people to understand that uh, these private loans are really, these, these things should be considered a loan of last resort. This is the last thing you should take out. I'm not a bank. If I were, I'd be pushing this stuff. I'm not a bank. I can't make money on direct loans. Um, I can only tell you that if you're going to borrow, do it from the government. And if you're thinking about, you know, home equity loan or something, that's a different story. Uh, you know what protections you have there? Virtually none. So I would say, even if it's a higher interest rate with the direct loans, investigate that first. So as you, uh, if you're a, a parent of a high school senior going to college, you've already seen the instructions to go to the studentaid.gov uh, uh, loan website. They complete a master promissory note, just simply put down some information, uh, parent, grandparent for a reference. Um, they take some entrance counseling and uh, basically just learning about the loans. And when they graduate, they take some exit counseling. Not a tough thing. Okay, let's talk about some stuff regarding the parent loans. So this is just for moms and dads. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The nice thing about a plus loan is that you don't have to put it in collateral to get the loan. And the interest is fixed. I have the interest rate that's coming up in a second. There are three repayment options. I mentioned that uh, there are the asterisk there because there's different ways to do that and increase your options. And as I mentioned, the school's going to certify so you borrow exactly the amount you want. And it's also much easier to get approval from the government. Happens like once you do it, if you've already done it, then you know how quickly it goes. But within 48 hours, it's all done. Uh, usually you'll get an instant credit approval like that. It's done. Um, and then uh, the amount goes to the school for certification. You know, they're going to say how much. And by the way, well, we'll talk. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. That's why I have notes. Now, good thing about the parent loans. In some cases, uh, the step parent can apply. So let's say uh, mom's remarried and uh, uh, her credit, you know, through the divorce wasn't so good, but she married a nice guy and he's willing to borrow the money for the, for the students on the, for the students benefit. That's nice. Um, now, if he lived to it, if, if the other parent, uh, the natural parent was living in another household, they could still do the same thing. They could borrow the money, but not that step parent in another household but the natural parent could. Uh, the deferment options exist. All you do is state when you take out the loan that you don't want to pay any interest. You don't want to make any payments uh, for that year and you won't owe anything. And then the, the uh, PLUS loans also have the same kind of forbearance options. For each loan, you get to postpone it for a year and you can do that three times for each loan. And you're going to see how that plays out in a second. 
Now here's some of the not so good stuff. Um, they have a much higher upfront origination fee. It's uh, over four and a quarter. This is this year uh, coming up this fall. Um, there are no income driven repayment options. Again, the asterisk means stick around so you can learn about that. Teasing that, you know, pre-selling that, right? You can't transfer the loan to your child. Like in a private loan, eventually, if you're making the payments, eventually the student proves that they're credit worthy enough, then the loan can, you know, the co-signer can have that loan turned over to the child. It can take 10 years. It's up to the lender, not you, but it can't happen. This can never happen. And of course, the more loans you have, even though you're um, not in default or delinquent or anything, uh, it can impede your credit because of this thing that the plus loans don't take in consideration. They don't take in consideration how much you already owe. It's called income to debt ratios. Plus loans don't look at that. They just want to know if you're current on what you do owe. But if you're buying a new car or a house or a boat or something and you're borrowing money, they're going to want to know if you can support that loan. So it can be, uh, that's something to consider. Also, the plus loans can't be discharged in bankruptcy. And if you don't pay them and you go into delinquency, default rather, uh, there's two different things, of course. But if you go into default, any tax refunds you have to, boom, lender's going to get them. And if you have any Social Security, when you start collecting, they're going to take 25%. And of course, your credit's ruined uh, forever. Well, not forever, but for a really long time. So to get these loans, parent has to be a US citizen or have a green card, permanent residency. Same process, you go to the uh, studentaid.gov uh, site for the loans and you complete a master promissory note, MPN. Uh, you only have to do it once every 10 years. So you only have to fill it once. You'll put in a, uh, I believe you'll put in, oops, went too far. Um, two references, a friend, and if you're employed, you'll put an employer down. Now they're not gonna be contacted. This is something that most people think, oh, they're gonna contact me on borrowing. No, 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 no. If you uh, become delinquent or go defaulting on your loan, then they're gonna look your, up your friend. Then they're gonna contact your employer, but not until then. I mean, imagine all the people taking plus loans out and, and student loans, they, they don't have time to call. They're not going to. Um, and then once you fill it, finish that, the college, you'll fill out some stuff online and the college will certify the amount. You'll take some entrance counseling. It's basically a pass fail test. Can't screw it up. And, uh, and the, and the money will be dispersed in October and December and January. The, uh, the loans actually don't become due until the second half of the loan is dispersed. So it wouldn't be till December, January, unless you elect to defer and then you don't know anything. Um, deferment avoids payments while students enroll for at least half time. You gotta be in school at least half time and you don't have to pay until six months after graduation on the regular, uh, the, the way it's set up for deferral. Uh, but it will add interest to the loan and you can use that same calculator. You can go back on the, and, and uh, if you remember how we did it, where you can look at the recording when it's eventually when it's published, you know, in five years from now or so, whatever Lance gets around to it. Um, then you can look it up. Uh, um, but yeah, but here's what I say. This is a tip. Whatever your uh, origination fee is, remember it's over four and a quarter. Um, you don't want to be paying interest on that part of the loan. Hopefully you have the resources. If you're going to borrow, say, $40,000 that, you know, you can take $1,600 and put it to the debt. So you're not paying interest on that. I hope you can, you know, if, what you're not paying the call is just hang on to that. And then when the loan goes to repayment uh, or you, you still in the deferral, but when you're able to make a payment, throw it at it in, uh, in, in December or January. Okay. Pay off that origination fee. All right. Um, so can't have any kind of uh, uh, adverse credit to get these loans. Um, if you owe more than $2,085 that's uh, in arrears for more than 90 days or in collections uh, in the past two years, uh, it's not gonna be a good thing in terms of getting these loans. Um, in the past five years, you can't have any of these. You can't be in default. You can't have a debt for due to a bankruptcy of any kind, a foreclosure, somebody repos your car, your TV set, whatever, not good. Tax liens, and if your wages are currently being garnished, no, yet. So you may want to look to the other parent uh, to take out that loan. 
And there's some reasons why you might want to actually, well, when we go over the strategies, a good question is, which parents should take out the loan? Well, we're going to answer that. Now, here's what everybody's been waiting for, okay? Paying pennies on the dollar using plus loan strategies. Okay. Good. All right. Now, the strategy, see, I'm getting into it. Uh, now, the strategy is to basically um, put off paying your loans as long as humanly possible and therefore making payments that would have gone to pay for college uh, into your bank account or your retirement account. Uh, there's a couple of strategies. One is for parents who want to help pay for their children's college education, uh, but would have to borrow to do that. Uh, but they're also concerned that they can't afford the loan payments because you borrow one loan, then you get another one, and you got payments, payments, payments. Even if you defer them, if by the time they all come due, you're going to owe four loans on one child. That's kind of unmanageable. Um, and especially if you're trying to save for retirement, you can't, many parents can't do both at the same time. And you know what colleges are costing these days. You know, I, I don't think you can go to college in four years uh, unless, you, you know, for under $100,000. I don't think it's possible anymore. Um, and uh, the second is for parents who could pay uh, for, uh, you know, they could pay the cost, but they'd rather keep their money for as long as possible and watch it grow and be in the position of never, ever having to pay them off. Ever, ever having to pay them off. Now, both strategies incorporate all the features that are available, that are really available. This is not any kind of BS. It, it's actually, it, go to studentaid.gov, you'll find all this is true. If you can sift through enough of it um, to connect the dots, but you'll find that this is all through the direct loan, federal loan program, and allows you to fund your retirement rather than give the colleges uh, the money or, or even the government. I mean, think about this. And I think I said this when we were in the very beginning, we were just sort of fooling around. Um, college costs have doubled in the past nine years. The degrees are worth probably less than they were then, yet they're double. Um, colleges tend to uh, exploit parents' emotions and uh, they keep raising prices. There's a lot of reasons why they keep going up. One is people just find a way to pay for it. You know, parents just said, wait a minute, we're not paying anymore. If everybody said, nope, that's it, more colleges would, you know, curb their, curb their increases. Um, unfortunately, um, most people just don't think about it. They go into debt and they hope for the best. That's not a good strategy. Hoping for the best is not good. So, um, there are a few differences. Um, I think I just, for those who can't pay in full, you're still gonna keep your money as long as possible. You're gonna fund your retirement. You're gonna repay using pennies on the dollar. So if you're paying 20 cents on the dollar later, then, I mean, give you a quick example. Let's say you're sending your kid, let's say you can afford the whole thing. Your students at a college cost $75,000 a year. That's $6,250 a month, 12 months. That's a pretty big check. Wouldn't you rather write a $500 check 13 years from now? Think about that, okay, per month. Um, it'd be great if you could qualify for loan forgiveness, like public service loan forgiveness programs. If you work for a not-for-profit of the government, you can do this if you follow these strategies. Now, ugh, I don't know why that keeps doing that. I mean, there, okay. So how does it work? So you got a child going to a four-year school. You're going to borrow four plus loans. Go through the process. We already talked about that. You borrow each loan. You're going to defer those payments all four years. Then you're going to elect forbearance on those four loans. You do it once each for each loan three times in a row. Now you have to give some kind of thing. Well, we're having trouble. You know, you can't pay this. I got other kids in college, whatever. And they give you that forbearance. Meanwhile, the interest is accruing. I know. And uh, it's capitalizing. But see, once you get to the end of that, and if you get tired of that, you don't want to go all that way. That's fine. You consolidate multiple loans. You consolidate the loans. Uh, a special program. You can take your loans and consolidate. But if you do it all into one loan, you don't get all of the benefits. So what you do is you take, let's say, okay, you've got one child, you've got four loans, you consolidate two, and then you consolidate the other two. 
and then you do what's called a double consolidation with another uh, federal servicer. And now you qualify for all sorts of income-driven repayment programs, ICR, income contingent, public ser uh, service loan forgiveness, where you didn't. Now, let's see, we got some case studies here. All right, this will probably spell it out pretty good. We got, got a guy, Sal, sweet, sweetheart of a guy, works for the DMV. He's not a, you know, a robot yet, but he, you know, he's a nice guy. And he's 55, he's got a couple of kids, divorced, remarried. And his income is about $60,000. doesn't pay a lot of that DMV. I think it's in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, so he doesn't want his wife to have to pay anything or suffer because of those loans he took out for his two, chil two children, $130,000 for the two of them. And he's having to pay, he's in a standard repayment program of $1,443 a month. He can't afford that. And he certainly can't afford to invest in his retirement. If he was able to pay this, it'd be $1,443 a month. He'd totally pay $172,000. That's what he would owe if he paid the whole thing. That's what he would have paid. So he can't afford the payments. So he consolidates the eight loans into two, qualifies for ICR, income contingent repayment. And now his new payment is $709 a month. It's half. Then... He takes the two loans and he consolidates them into one double consolidation loan. And what happens? Make sure I'm on the right slide. Okay. First thing he's doing is he's going to look at his tax return and say, he's going to say, honey, we're not filing jointly anymore because here's what's going to happen. We, yeah, me married, you save a few bucks, but I'm paying $1,443 a month on my kids' loans. Now I'm going to pay by filing separately. I'm going to pay $282 for 20 years at $67,680. It's going to save $1,161 a month. He can't afford any of that, right? But he can certainly afford the 280, he can afford 282, and he can afford now to put 500 a month towards his retirement. And because he's putting money towards his retirement, he's reducing his taxable income on his adjusted gross, thereby lowering his payments. Pretty sweet. So Barbara, she's a sales manager. She's got two kids. She's 46, had a household, divorced, age, uh, AGI of 60,000. She has her own loans, $60,000, $70,000. She still has, she hasn't paid off yet. She's got two daughters. She's taken out loans of 117, total debt between her loans and the kids' loans, $187,000. Got it? 187,000, she's a middle-aged woman. Made, make 60,000. She's having to pay $1,200 a month. She can only pay, afford to pay 600. She hasn't saved much for retirement. Her current plan is costing her 1,200 a month, right? 300 months, that's $360,000. That's a lot of money. And what was her original loan? She owed 187. Now she's double, $360,000. So what she's going to do is the same thing Sal did. She's going to consolidate those 12 loans because she's got some herself and her kids have uh, four each. She's got four. They got, they got two, uh, four each. They're going to consolidate into two loans. Then she's going to consolidate that under a revised earn uh, as you pay, as you, revised pay as you earn. There's so many acronyms. It's revised pay as you earn program. And her new payment is now $290 a month. She has to pay it in 20 years. That's the new limit for that. You can't go beyond that. But if you don't pay it by then, it's forgiven. $69,600. That's what she's going to pay versus uh, the $360,000. Now, if that doesn't make you go, whoa, what's wrong with this picture? Then, you know, then you're not paying attention. Um, but this is, in fact, the way it works. I've run the numbers. I went through this stuff four days, looked at people's cases, and this is exactly what happens. So she's saving $290,000 in loan payments. And if she invests $300 a month for 20 years, and she'll be what, 66 at 7%, she's got 150, almost $160,000 in retirement she didn't have. Not only did she pay the kids' loans off, her loans off, but now she's got something to retire on. 
and she can have a quality of life. Before, she, you know, that's a lot of money if you make 60000 You got nothing. Now, I have to tell you, this is not something you want to do without help, okay? You really just don't want to do this without help. It's There's too many... Um, it's not that you can't do it, uh, but it just, there's too many things to consider. Your financial situation, number one, um, if, if you're, um, uh, you know, which repayment program is going to make the sense for you? Um, how much, you know, should you do married filing separately? I mean, there's a lot of things to do. And then when you actually go through the consolidations, you know, how do you do that? Do you do them online? Do you do it with your same servicer? These are all things that you need to know. They're simple steps, but you need to follow them exactly. Okay, just, just be very careful when you do it. Get some help. My goodness, it's you know you'll save a lot of it. If you're going to save one hundred fifty thousand dollars, it's worth a couple hundred bucks. Not to me. I don't do this for people. There's people that do this. I can send you the people that do this. Anyway, so for those who can write the check, heck, defer the payments. Go into forbearance. Consolidate and use forbearance for three years. I mean, think about it. what's going to happen. Then you double consolidate, go into forbearance for another three years. You pay nothing for 13 years. Keep your money. What does that do? I don't know why that's popping up. So imagine you're saving 75, let's say, you know, you're going to a pretty expensive school, $75,000 a year, four years. At 7%, you're saving that money. Now you end up with 353000 and after nine more years, not contributing anything, now you got 662,000. And I think 7% is a reasonable rate of return over a great period, long period of time. And the parent with the least income takes out the loans. So less than $100,000 per year. In this case, we're looking at 100. The repayment uh, with the accumulated, uh, you're gonna start to repay with those accumulated investments. It doesn't adversely hurt your credit score. It doesn't affect your income. It does affect your income to debt ratios, but it, say you're the spouse, uh, your husband makes or your wife makes a lot more than you. Um, you don't make as much. Uh, you go into double, double consolidation, you're paying a few hundred dollars a month. Uh, the interest uh, accrues, so what? It doesn't matter. By the time these loans come due, you'll be dead. I mean, that, that's, that's actually, you know, I have a client, he's 66. His wife's 10 years younger. She works. He doesn't really. He invests money. So he's got some uh, some money in a stock thing he does. So why should he pay anything? He'll take all these loans out, do the strategy. And, uh, you know, by the time he's in his mid-80s, he's not going to worry about it. You know, just not going to worry about it. So that's uh, that's pretty much how it works. I mean, it is a little common. I try to simplify it. But what I was just trying to show you is that it's really um, doable if you do a little planning, you know? And hopefully you have a greater understanding now um, of how student and parent repayment works. Um, now, I don't, as I said, I don't advocate going into debt, not without a strategy. With college costs going up 4% a year, uh, cost of attendance at a 60K uh, college is gonna cost 62 for next year. Um, Colleges tend to give you a, a little less help every year. So, so let's keep them honest. Um, let's just keep them honest. Uh, I mean, keep yourself in, in, keep yourself in a position where you don't have to uh, jeopardize your retirement and your, your, your good standing and your emergency reserves and things that you need. Absolutely. Um, pay attention to this stuff. If you can't afford it to pay out of pocket, think about loan strategies.